Yep. Okay. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we're going to be having fun with a handsaw. Um, one of the questions or one of the big things that people have problems with the first time is how do you exactly follow that line so you can cut straight down the line and make really precise cuts. Uh, now the handsaw really is the beginning tool. It is more important to, to learn to cut straight than it is to do any other shop, uh, any other thing in the shop. So we're going to be really focusing on that and looking at a few other things. Um, how do you know when the saw has a problem or how do you know when you have the problem? Uh, so there are a lot of little fun things I like that. I never have a problem. My wife never has a problem. She picks up a saw and cuts these perfectly straight well, lines Well, I was talking about time. just the saw and I, I am saw. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, yes. Saw. Uh, hi. Yeah, yeah. Saw is uh, Sarah always Not right. Not the sharpest saw. saw in the box, are you? Oh, yeah. I got a, a box in the mail and I was asked to open it on the air. So I thought this would be kind of fun to do. Um, so... Exciting time. We're going to be doing a live unboxing. Ooh, I hope it's it not from? underwear. Um, it is from, I can't remember his name. I can't read the handwriting either. Oh, it was Kindred Spirit. Di, uh, D, uh, um, oh, it's going to bug me now. Give me the box when you're done. I'll read it. It's this. Here. I'm used to your handwriting. He's. Randy, there we are. Randy yeah. Dangle? Dang. Spell it. I'm going to D, I can't even, T, D A I G L E. Dangle. So thank you, Randy. You Let's see what he got me. Oh, here, it probably says in the note. Uh, this is for your Stanley 48. Your knob was missing. Oh, cool. Ah, so there is a knob that goes on the Stanley 48. So I might have my. My swing arm plane here is missing, whoop, falling over the knob on it. So this should fit down on there. That so is, is cool. that your Cinderella plane? Yes, yes, my Cinderella plane. So, so yeah. is Randy Prince Turner? No, anyways. <laughs> so thank you, Randy. That's kind of cool. Um, I talked to you in a message the other day, or about a month or so ago, and you had said something about sending it to me. That's cool. Do a little fitting to make it work on there. But voila, a knob for it. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Um, having a little bit of fun with the mailbox today. Uh, let's see. Oh, we got a few other things coming up. Um, this weekend, I'm going to be at DFM Toolworks. Uh, he's the guy who makes the card scrapers for Wood by Right, so the Wood by Right logo scrapers. And I just got these back in stock. I've been out of stock for a little while. Um, so if you've been wanting one of those, they are now back in stock on woodbyright.com. So you can pick up one of those scrapers. Uh, but he's having an open house at his shop. I'll try and leave a link to that in the description below. Um, it's not there right now, but it will be soon. Uh, but that'll be uh, this Sunday afternoon, I believe it is. So we'll be having fun there. And then next week, woohoo! Um, I'm going to be at the Midwest Tool Collectors Association National Meet. So this is the big tool meet. Um, it will be in Peoria, Illinois. Peoria? Yeah, Peoria, yes. Illinois. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to be doing a talk. So we're actually going to be taking the bench down there and having some fun um, showing some things off. So if you want to come and say, hey, I'm looking forward to meeting you there. Um, I'll be there. I'll be there Thursday and Friday. I won't be able to be there Saturday. So looking forward to that. Anything I'm forgetting before we dive in? I think we should mention tomorrow because lots of people Yes, my know. mom, who is probably, I don't know if she'll be watching right now. It depends on whether or not she's at um, she's actually in the hospital right now and will be uh, going up there to, um, she's going to have open heart surgery. So uh, wishing, Lots you of a, prayers. wishing you a good and, uh, and uh, recovered so, time. <laughs> Mama Myra. Don't, don't have too much fun. But yeah, we'll be up there. Um, so if, if things are a little bit slower this week on the social media, as you understand, me and my wife are having fun going back and forth to the hospital. Because so. I don't spend enough time in hospitals. <laughs> yes. Ah, yes. Um, so, um, hi, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> be the football, football player just won the, the Super Bowl. Hi, Mom. Um, uh, what was I doing? Oh, sign. Yeah. So, um, hand saws. How do you actually make these things go straight? Uh, and I want to actually start with a back saw here. Uh, and this is this is not a hand saw. This is a hand saw. It is a hand saw. Is a long 
paneled saw. A panel saw is a shorter paneled saw. It doesn't have a back on it. Then any saw with a back on it is called a back saw. And those then come in a bunch of different types. This is a carcass saw, which has cross-cut teeth. And it's kind of the middle size. This is the one I use more than anything else in the shop. It is the, the go-to saw. The, the carcass saw is the one you, you grab and have fun with. Uh, but we're going to be starting with this and actually doing a few cuts on here. And the reason I want to start with this one is this saw currently has a problem where it veers to the left. And I want to show what it looks like when you are the one making the problem and what it looks like when the saw is making a problem. So that might actually help people a lot. So you're saying that. I should just do it so that people can see when I'm the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions while I set this up? No. No questions yet? No, but Ross is, has sold his children for medical experiments, apparently. Oh, yeah, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, two. There we go. So first thing I want to do is I'm going to cut down this board and show, actually draw a, a straight line on here that I'll parallel. Because if you ever want to know if you're cutting straight, you need to have something to judge it against. So I'm just going to draw, actually I'm going to draw a few lines on here because I'm going to need to make a few cuts on here. Just something to follow. Set that in there. And then I'm going to, I, I know that this saw is the point where I can force it to follow the line but I want to just cut it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold it very loose in my hand. So you can see how my hand has almost no grip on it at all. Um, I'm not like squeezing it down. I'm just letting it, letting it be loose in my hand. And I'm gonna let the saw do the work. So I mean, I'm basically not even gonna hold it with my fingers. I'm just gonna keep it so it doesn't fall off. Once it gets established, let the saw do the work. And you can see how right there, I'm already veering way off the line. Well, actually, I don't know if you can see that. Let me zoom in a little bit more here. I might even have to get a little closer than that even. Let's see if I can get closer. I don't know if, yeah, 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 we can see it. You can see how the line is veering way off over here. Now, if I really wanted to, I could focus on it and I could keep it parallel to the line. But it takes some work on my part to keep it down there. And even then, at the bottom, it's starting to veer off. Um, so I want to fix that. So the, the problem with it is that it is wanting to turn that way. So that means that the teeth on this side of the plate, or on this side of the plate over here, this te these teeth are sticking out too far that way. So the set on this side is very, very heavy. Okay. So in this case, all I want to do is I'm going to grab my diamond plate here, and I'm going to run it just a couple times down this side here. One, two, three. And then we're going to bring it back over here and see what it does. Does it cut straighter here? Establish it. Loose grip. And that's a little bit better. It's not quite as far off. So let's do a couple more strokes. One, two, what I'm basically doing is I'm taking the very, the very edge of the set off of this here. So now we can do it one more time. Establish it. That's pretty much dead on. I'm going to do one more pass just to make sure it's right over there. And we should be good to go. And that's how I can straighten out a saw and make sure I'm getting a nice, clean cut. Yeah, that's happy. Nice and straight down. So whenever you are running into the problem of a saw veering off, if you notice that the same saw is always veering off in the same direction every time, it's usually because the set on the teeth are sticking out too far on one side than the other. And so if you just take a sharpening stone, run it a few, side, a few times down one side, you'll be able to take that set off there and clean them up. So, and uh, oh. yeah, what? Um, Greg Cheng is asking if you can darken your knife line with a pencil. I don't know if they... Oh, well, you can't see it here. I have to zoom in so closer for you to see, see it. Not that in here. general. Let's see if I can get in here for you. There. And so you can see I have knife line, knife line, knife line. So this is the first one. And then I did three passes here, and it brought it over here. So you can see it's close to the we line, but it's still veered off over here. We can't see. Oh, I'm on the wrong camera. Sorry. There you go. So here's my knife line here. And this is the first cut. It came off. 
and it's probably about uh, what three millimeters away over here so I did three passes here and then it veered off a little bit more over this side so it's probably what a millimeter or two that way and then I took a couple more strokes and you can see how it's just cutting onto that side of the line I was trying to cut onto this side of the line so that's why I did one more pass and I can cut that one down the middle so now I have a nice straight cutting cut there um, yeah so when when cutting um, if it's always veering to the same side it's probably the saw so don't assume that it's just your problem um, but it, really the only way to tell that is to have that really loose grip and let the saw do the cutting and don't put any force into it but that can be very hard for someone if you're just getting started so you're kind of running into the problem of in order to tell if it has the saw you have to have good form um, <laughs> so how do you tell if it's the saw or good form if you don't have good form to begin with um, and so that's one of the things I want to actually talk through is the form of the saw. Yes, there are problems that make a saw go off course, but they're fairly easily fixable. Okay, time up. Before you go any further. What's that? I keep getting questions about what grit diamond plate you're using. Uh, that was the extra course. Um, I use, it doesn't really matter. I'll use any of them. Um, it just takes more strokes with the fine one. But that was the, that was, because I have, I have coarse, fine, and extra fine. And then I have the extra coarse, and that's just the one that's loose, and so that's the one I grab. Um, I've done it with the extra fine, uh, and it will work with any of them, so don't worry about that too much. Just grab whichever one's on hand. Um, just you know, realize the heavier the grit, the faster it takes it off. Um, I have sim seen some people do it with a file. That works really well. You just want to make sure with a file you don't take too much because that can take off a lot of material very quickly. Um, so it doesn't really matter what grit as long as you're not taking off too much too fast. Ten answer. Cool. Um, cutting that, I'm trying to make... Okay, yeah, so let's talk about the very first thing. So the, the first skill that you want to learn when actually cutting is you want to keep correct body format. You want to have the saw in line with your wrist, in line with your arm, and all the way up into your elbow and shoulder so that your whole arm is moving in one rotation. If any one of those get out of point, it starts making your saw do weird things because it's, it's sort of like trying to push a chain. If, any, if, if they are all perfectly in line, you can actually physically push a chain. But if any one of those links are slightly out of line, then they start wobbling all over the place. And most of the time, the biggest problem is that people are trying to see the line, so they move their body over into the, way, the line of the cut, and that moves your arm out of line. You want to get your body out of the way, and that's why you usually want to cut with the line on your side of the saw so you can still see the line. If the line is on the other side, then you're bending over here and your body mechanic is already going wild. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more when we go over to the, the saw bench. And uh, when I first got started, I didn't have a saw bench. I didn't have much space in the shop and that was before I rearranged things and actually created some more space. So I did a lot of saw work at the, at the bench here. And so I wanna show that first because I find Working at the bench is a little bit easier to learn than working at the saw at the at the saw bench. Um, it's the same setup; it's just another way of doing it. Uh, I'll grab a different piece here. So, any questions while I set this up? No. No. Okay. So, let's grab this one and draw a line across here. And so, when I'm working here, the problem that I'm going to have is that the height to the saw is always a different place. So if I'm cutting up here, my arm is pulled out. Let me bring it on this way. If I'm cutting up here at eye level, then when I pull back, my elbow goes out. And that makes my saw go all over the place. If I'm cutting down too low, then, well, I can, I can if, there isn't really a too low, but if you're cutting down lower, then it's easier to keep your hand in line. I usually don't like to cut any higher than my elbow. So if my elbow's hanging, that's where I want to be. The other option is you can actually turn your body back and now you can cut up. And you'll see me do that a lot where I'll actually go down on one foot. And I want to show you that technique which I really enjoy. A lot of people really don't, but I do and I find it to work really well, um, at least for the way I do things. So what I do here is at this point... You really have got the outfit on today. Yeah, I, I'm styling! <laughs> uh, at this point here, my arm is just about elbow height, so I don't want to go too much higher than this. So I can start the cut here, and at this point, I'm using my big crosscut saw, trying to push it in, it doesn't work that way. 
what I want to do is I can run it here and keep my arm in line. But if I'm getting down or if I'm moving the stick up higher, what I actually do is I like to kneel down and now I've moved my body back and I can cut uphill and still keep my arm in line. And so with this, I can get a nice clean cut all the way down. Now, that is a style that I like and there aren't too many other people who like that. Um, but I want to show it because I'm weird and I like weird things. So <laughs> um, you can cut long rips at the bench. You don't need a saw bench. But that means it's going to take a little bit more skill and a little bit more style to do. So I'm going to be just demonstrating most of the cuts here at the bench because that's what I'm comfortable with. And then I'm going to take you over to the saw bench and show you just how that um, interprets a little bit more and changes a few things around. Um, what's next? Or do you have so, anything? Yeah, I have one question. Aubrey cool. Kuhn asks, will you also be showing pole slash Japanese saw form as well, or is it not something you use enough to show yet? Um, I am not as comfortable with Japanese style. I haven't mastered that as well. That and um, true Japanese style and work holding and cutting is done on the floor sitting down and not at a bench. And so anything I do up here is going to have a slightly different body mechanic than doing it down on the floor. Um, on top of that, I'm not as um, uh, I'm not as adept at working with a pole saw. Now I will talk about some of the differences towards the end here, um, but most of the things still stay in place. If you're going to do it one hand, um, a lot of Japanese sawing can be done two hand pulling towards you, in which case then your elbows just have to mirror each other. Whereas with one hand you still want everything in line. You still want that same idea of everything flowing together. Um, so a lot of those things that go into western saws also go into eastern saws. Um, you just have to think through it a little bit more. Uh, so let's actually talk about steering the saw. And this is one of the things that really scares a lot of people is how do you steer the saw? So you're cutting down a little ways and you notice that you're starting to go off course over here. How do you bring it back into course? Do I have to answer something? Nope. Okay. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to go back and read it later. Um, so you're starting to see yourself going off course. What the first thing I want you to do is I want you to realize that this saw is not just a cutting edge on the very bottom, but it also has cutting edge on the sides of the plate. So as the saw is coming down, you're cutting down the bottom, but you're also cutting off the sides. That's because there is set on the teeth. So the teeth stick out a little bit farther on this side, and they stick out a little bit farther on that side. And that set will actually allow you to cut side to side as well as down. And once you wrap your brain around that thought, steering a saw becomes really straightforward. So once you see it going off course, the best thing to do is to stop. Don't try and bring it back into course because the moment you try and bring it back into course, you're just going to be creating this S curve that goes through the board and you're going to be all over the place. The best thing to do is stop, back it up, and twist the saw a little bit and try and clean up that line to keep it straight down there. When you twist the, the, straw, the saw this way, you're going to be forcing the sides of the teeth into the cut. So let me show you what I'm talking about over, over here. And you can actually use that side cut to steer it a little bit. So in this case, I'm actually not showing the right camera. Hello, there we go. Um, so you should be able to see this line that I've already cut down to here. Now, when, since I already have a line here, it's very, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard not to show. I guess I could have cut it with a problem here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by twisting the saw. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually twist the saw this way. So I'm going to use the grip and I'm going to keep it in line, but I'm going to rotate the saw this way. And I'm going to come over here and just twist it in the, in the, in the curve here. And I'm going to use the sides of the teeth to grind away a little bit this. And you see how I'm just grinding over a little ways and a little ways and a little ways. And now I've created this shelf right here. Zoom in a little bit more for that. Boop, up, shelf. So now I've created this shelf right here. And once I've created enough of that shelf, so I can back up a little bit more, use the side of the teeth, and grind down a little bit more. Now I have that shelf there. Now I can rest the saw in that and continue on a straight cut on the way down. And here you can see 
just with that little bit of movement, I was able to veer the saw that much. Um, so it's, it's relatively easy. If you see yourself going off course, it doesn't take much force at all to just twist the saw a little bit and use it to scratch the side and bring your, bring your cut back into, uh, into the course you want. So you're trying, you're, boy, I'm getting tongue tied tonight. You're kind of thinking of the saw as a file rather than thinking of it as a saw. Use the set of the teeth to bring that curve back into line. Any questions? No? No. Oh, okay. Well, then let me actually think about the, let me talk about the actual steering. So you have three different ways you can rotate the saw. Number one, you can rotate it this way. Number two, you can rotate it this way. Number three, you can rotate it this way. The third method, this one really doesn't have that much application to its straightness of cut because you're still rotating it in line with the plane of the saw. So the other two rotations are the ones where you can use to steer it. So if you see yourself going off course and you see yourself veering, you're going to want to rotate the saw this way. Don't let the saw rotate this way, just allow it to twist. It's all on the wrist. Keep your arm in line, but allow your wrist to rotate. And that will allow you to steer it down the cut. One problem that a lot of people have is I'm perfectly on the line on my side, and then I go around and look at the other side and I'm way off over there. That, what happened there is your arm is going out of alignment and your saw is starting to veer. So you're forcing the saw to actually twist this way in the cut. And so you can change that and bring it back by twisting it the opposite direction. So if I'm seeing that I'm going off the line that way, and it's because my saw has been twisting this way, I'm gonna put force back on the saw, and as long as I keep my side on the line, the teeth on the other side are actually gonna be using it as that same filing action to bring the other side back into alignment. Now that takes a lot of skill to do. Um, it's not something that you can easily do putting force into the saw and still keeping it on the line your, on your side. You can do that, uh, but usually again, the easiest way is to stop, take the board out, flip the board over, and then use that same sawing technique to bring the other side back into alignment and then continue your cut on down. Once you can master that bringing the line back into alignment without continuing the cut, um, in other words, if you've cut down four inches and you're off the line, back up two, three inches until you are back on the line and reestablish it from there. Don't try and continue that line. Once it's off course, don't try and fix it at that point. Back up and bring it back onto course. Um, so it's all about that, that control. Once you get your body mechanic all in line, then the saw will do the work as long as the saw is set up right. And you'll get these really nice straight cuts down every time. Um, questions? This would actually be a good time to Can bring up. Can I practice? Up... What's that? Can I practice? Uh, let me talk about this and then, yeah, we'll okay. play with that. That would be fun. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, let me do talk about one big difference between Japanese and Western saws. Western saws cut on the push stroke. Japanese saws cut on the pull stroke. And the, the things that is nice about that is when you are a beginner, most of the problems that beginners have is they are over controlling the saw and they're trying to make the saw do what it should do. And the problem is a Western saw is designed to do what it should do. And if you get out of the way and just provide the power for the saw, the saw will cut a perfectly straight line. If you're not over correcting it, then you're not gonna have as much of a problem. The reason that it's a problem is if you're cutting through the board, so here we've got a board here that I'm cutting through. If I'm pushing on it, the leading tooth, the one that's doing the most cut, is on my side of the board. So as I'm pushing through, the leading tooth is on my side. So any little bit of movement I have in my hand, that leading tooth is gonna move the line around. And then I will be moving all over the place. So if I'm over controlling, it's going to just go all over the place. With a Japanese or Eastern style saw, the pull stroke means that the leading tooth is on the other side. And I have no control over what the other side is doing as long as I'm not veering out of the way too much. So as long as the saw was set up to cut straight, it is going to continue to cut straight because nothing is interfering with the other side of the saw, making it really easy for a beginner to get a nice straight line. The problem with it is, once you've gotten the body mechanic down and you've gotten the, the, the 
the control into it, and you want to control the saw, it takes a lot of force to make a Japanese saw turn. It makes a lot of force to correct a cut with a Japanese saw. Whereas with a Western saw, um, once you learn the body mechanic, you can control these beautifully and they can turn on a dime and bring lines around. Um, and you can do some really interesting control with a Western saw because you have all the control on your side. But for a beginner, um, Japanese saws are a little bit easier that way. So that's one of the things to think back and forth and why beginners often um, go a lot more to the Japanese saws because they are easier to learn in that respect. Any questions? Oh, Anyone? I've got like six questions all of a sudden. Oh, well, let's answer a couple questions and maybe you can set it up for you to give it a try. Okay. So grab a board to work with that. Ah, there we go. So what? Let's let's see, first one is the real Evora. Evora, I'm not sure. Do you have a coping saw? I have several coping saws. I had a couple fret saws up in here. Yes. <laughs> and then ZZ asks, any tips on how to maintain our saw blade teeth? Um, I have several videos on sharpening them. Um, all saws will dull, and that's just the nature of things. Um, try not to run them into other things, like concrete floors. Um, but other than that, they will eventually dull, and you'll have to sharpen them. That's one of the big differences between power tools and hand tools. Hand tools, everything in the shop is designed to be sharpened. Power tools, it's designed to be thrown away and bought a new blade. <laughs> now, that's taking a bit things, things a bit too far, but um, yeah, um, sharpening. Another one? Yeah. Douglas Dyer Jr. asks, what saw do you use for dovetails? A dovetail saw. Um, this is a uh, one from Bearcat Woodworking, and it is my absolute favorite saw in, uh, in my shop. And here, let me show you this thing, because it's just, it's so cool to show off. Two, here you go. A dovetail saw usually has a short plate. It's a little bit longer for its, for its height. It has a very, very thin plate. Um, it, the kerf has almost nothing. And there's very little set on the teeth. And even some saws don't have any set at all. So they're very fine tooth, um, usually in a rip format. Although some people like putting a slight hybrid with about uh, 10 degrees of flame or so. Um, but yeah, this is my dovetail saw. Hey, happiness. <laughs> One more and then we'll play with you. Uh, <laughs> just, anyways, Matt <laughs> Azula asks, I know the panel saw has a taper. If you would be so kind, could you grab your mic micrometer and measure tooth edge versus back edge? I have never it, actually right? done that before. And I don't know if I have a micrometer here. I don't think my calipers would reach past the set. No, I don't have a micrometer here. But yes, what he's talking about is that a, a traditional handsaw, the back is actually tapered and it's thinner up here than it is down here. So the amount of steel up here, the plate is, is thinner. Um, and so it's nice because it gives you a little more leeway in the cut. So it's not gonna be binding as much, especially with how tall this is. Um, if, the, if the cut starts to seize up at all, it's not going to pinch it as much because it's thinner up here than it is down here. And yes, um, you can actually see the difference in thickness. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to see it on camera. Um, it is a good bit thinner up here. They've ground it down. Um, so it's one of the nice things about old hand saws. Um, uh -huh. The big ones are, are kind of cool that way. She's giggling. You, yeah, is my wife's audio better tonight? You don't know what popped out of your mouth, so that's why I'm <laughs> giggling. And let me know if my wife's audio is better tonight because we're trying out a different microphone. Um, the microphone I had on was so focused that anytime she would turn around, it wouldn't pick her up. So hopefully it's a little bit better. Um, you want to give it a try? Sure. Here, I'm going to grab a different saw. That one's a little bit overkill for you. No, it's not. Here. I'm going to run you over. <laughs> so here, let me. So here, why don't you. Oh, they're talking behind our backs. That's normal. Well, normal for me, at least. Here. Now, you're going to be cutting uphill a bit. Well, do we want my stool? Or can I here. Can yeah. stand behind your saw bench? Is that overkill? That would be overkill. Uh, okay. Yeah, there is no happy meat. Well, it's, it's small. No, I am not. So we're going to try 
the stool that I made a while ago. Here. Okay, at least I have Try the that. tennis shoes on. See, that's the right height for you. Um, hold it in your hand. Let me see where. You want me to go back yeah, you want to back off. You want to move that way a little bit farther. What? Yeah. That way. Because you want to be out of the way of the cut. That's the problem most people have is the body gets in the way. Okay, then put it up on the line there. I'm going for this line? Yep. Okay. Now, for like super newbie, would you also mark on top? Yeah, I can, but I mean, we're not worrying about that. Let me just do that for you then. Yeah, I didn't put the line on top of the board as well. Who might find that useful? There you go. You got a line on top of the board. Okay. Let me grab this though. Oh, I can't do that from here. All right. So put the saw up on the board. Okay. Yes. Okay. And there are two different ways to start a saw. Okay. Um, some people, beginners, like to pull it back because the tooth are, le tooth are less aggressive and you can start it. Mm -hmm. I like to just start on the push stroke. But you want to think about the saw being in line with your wrist, being aligned all the way up to your shoulder. So when you pull it back, it should be right beside you. Is that a problem? Yeah. Okay. No, you're right there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Here's, here's the other uh, problem that you're going to be having. This is, this is a very common problem, is you're putting force down in the saw. Okay. You actually want to think about lifting the saw off of it. Okay. So try and move it a half inch above the plate. So lift it up and try and move it back and forth a half inch above the, the work. Wait, like this? Yeah, without touching the work. Keep it up okay. and move it back and forth. Well, that's, the f that's the amount of weight you want to have on there. Okay. You, don't want any pl you don't want any weight of the saw on the work. Do you have a smaller saw? I do. Just for practice. Um, Otherwise, I'll make it work. Here, let me, well actually, why don't you just do it with this? It's a cross-cut tooth, but it'll work fine for this. Okay. So again, hold the weight um, in your hand. So this, the bottom horn here oh, that's is okay. what the weight needs to be on. Okay. And then move it back and forth above, and you want that same weight on it until it touches in the line. There you go. Okay, I don't know if I'm totally in line. Yep, you are. And so now you're just letting the saw do the cut. And once it's established, you can put a little bit more force down onto it to allow it to cut faster, but then there's also a better chance that you're going to jab it. I now, you're, right now, I... you're, you're only using like that much of the saw. Okay. Which, I mean, isn't a problem, but you paid for the whole saw, so why not use it? There you go. Okay, sorry, my glasses are also getting weird. <laughs> to do effective with the Here, I'm going to switch over cameras and let people see your line cutting here. Oh, dear. Um, one, two. Now, in theory, if I'm just going back and forth, it should just continue. Yeah, now, you just, now you're down to full depth because you hit the back of this. Oh. But you pull it out. You can see you're dead on that line all the way down. Oh. She did good. There's a reason I married her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Let me talk about. Why don't you see if there's any more questions, oh, and then I'll talk I'm about. Sure, uh, there are. No, Whoa. they're just talking about all sorts of things behind your back. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the course. So I mean, a lot of learning a saw is learning to not control the saw. Apple? You do oh, not I don't have my stool. <laughs> Hang oh, on. I'm no, it's fine. You do not need to control the saw. The saw, if it's set up right will do what it should do. Um, take the weight off of the saw, keep your arm in line with it, and you'll cut a nice straight line. It, it's really not that difficult. Um, at least in theory, it's not that difficult. Um, going back to when I first started, you know, it was like a good uh, six months to a year of working with a handsaw until I was confident that no matter how long the cut is, I could stay right on the line and not think anything of it. Um, it just becomes a natural thing eventually. But it takes that practice, it takes that experience to, to do that. Because your natural instinct is to cut the board in half. <laughs> and when you're doing that, your arm is going out of course, and you're putting all the weight down into the saw, and it's gonna naturally go out of the way because you're forcing it to do something. So, any questions while I set up for the other? Um, I, was, well, I was trying to catch up on these, so give me a second. Oh, okay, because I'm gonna set up here to do some work on the bench and show a few things off on that. So, yeah. Um, so, so what? Hi. It's time for my close up. 
Well, at least we can't see the shorts then. Um, <laughs> James Carthy who asked, I have a bush saw, parentheses, Australian term, probably a bow saw in U.S. speak, that pulls to the left a lot. I tried to use the technique you showed, but it didn't really help. Any other ideas? Um, well, I'm, th I'm assuming you're talking about like, let me grab this one just a moment. I'll come back around. The ghost is talking behind the camera. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about like this, which is, we call it a buck saw. Um, and there, with one of these, the problem can actually be that the blade is twisted. And if the blade is twisted, or if the, because a lot of times if you, if you look down it, you'll notice that the blade itself actually has a little bit of a wind to it. And that will cause the saw to go off course. Um, so that is one of the things you can do is look down the saw and see if it's twisted, see if the plate itself is flat, see if the plate has a kink in it. Um, if any of those are the case, it's going to want to wander and do other things. Um, but most of the time, the problem is in the set and the teeth are sticking out farther on one side than the other. But if there's any twist in the plate, um, that will cause all sorts of issue. Cool. Grab this and this and this. So, oop, flip that out so I can, can I see what I'm doing. ask you another question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I can set up some lines on here so that we can follow. Let's see. Greg Cheng asks, can you suggest exercises or practice cuts we can perform or practice to try these at home? Yeah, I'm going to show um, some practice cuts here at the end. I want to do some long cuts here because long rip cuts are often the hardest things to do. But there are a few practices that you can do that will make it a little easier. Have one more question, Melissa? Uh, sure. Uh, Patrick Morgan asks, can you recommend a coarse saw file for restoring old hand saws? Can't seem to find one that will not ruin my normal file and just got a bunch of old ones that need lots of work. Um, you know, honestly, the regular triangular files you can get at the big box store work perfectly fine. They won't last as long, but they will cut just as well. Um, and so for the longest time, that's all I used. They're cheap, they're dirty, they work well. Um, and they'll sharpen five or six times and then you throw them out. Um, but the, yeah, those will work perfectly fine. You just gotta understand that they're disposable. Um, uh, if you want good ones, the ones I usually grab are, uh, they're Baco, I think is the name. Uh, actually, uh, Lee Valley sells them. So they're, uh, they're kind of nice. I'm gonna darken up these lines so you can actually see them a little better on camera. I'm going to set up one camera a little closer. Are you ready for another question? Sure. Uh, Space City Junk Removal asked, can you give some tips on cutting up or down the grain? I'm still confused about that, and he would like a close-up of your clogs. Or she. Clogs. <laughs> I have a video on carving these if you want to see them, so look up Wood by Wright Clogs. Um, you can see that. Um, I don't know what you mean by up or down. Um, Unless they mean against? Yeah, because you, you have cross grain cuts where you cut across the grain and you have rip cuts that you cut with the grain. Um, and I'll talk about those a little bit at the end. But uh, yeah, I don't know what you're saying. So feel free to clarify. Now this is a saw bench and it is one of the easiest ways to make long cuts. The saw bench, its height is measured by the height you kneel at. So if I were to be out here, I'd measure from the ground to my knee and then I'd add about one inch for the thickness of the board, and that's the height. And a lot of people think, oh my word, that would kill your knees. I mean, it's actually really comfortable. It's, once you do it a few times, it's really nice. And I'm gonna set on here, I'm gonna pinch the board with my fingers. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more so you can see the beginning of this. Ooh. Ah, this is hard to do upside down. There we go. Focus. There we go. I'm going to pinch the edge of the board here, and what that allows me to do is push the saw side to side. And so as I pinch harder, the force of pinching is going to push the saw back that way, and then lessening off allows it to bring it back. That allows me to control it a little bit better. So you can see I can pinch it like that, and then I can bring it and fine tune exactly where it is. And I'm just going to push the saw against my fingers, again letting it ride in the air above the cut, until the teeth engage, and I've made my cut. And even with the big teeth like this, it cuts into it pretty quickly. And then I'm gonna work on keeping my saw in line with my body and cutting all the way down. 
Let me lift this up. I'm trying to keep the, the camera in line with everything here so you can see that all. Hey, there we go. Now this is one of the best ways to learn is to set up a camera in line with your saw and you'll see if your arm goes off one way or the other. Most of the time the problem is your body gets in the way like this and then you're trying to work with it over here. So get your body out of the way. Don't slide. Get your body out of the way and then cut down the saw. Cut down the plate. And it's hard not to stop. <laughs> um, and you'll notice if you go off the course, let me make it go off course here a little bit. So I've gone off course over here. Um, and let me zoom in so you can see it a little better. Any question while I'm setting this up? Sure. Let's see. Uh, Aubrey Kuhn asks, can you also show a hacksaw stance if you have one at hand? Since it's a cheap fine saw for dovetails, etc., but requires two hands to use. I just use one hand with my hacksaw, but I'll show that at the end. So here I've got, I've gone off course here. And so I'm veering off the line a little bit. Let me turn a little bit more here. And if I were to try and force it back into line, I'm going to often, on a thin piece like this, break it off like that. Or I'm going to go past the line on the other side here. But if I back it up a little bit and use the side of the teeth back here where I started to go off course, create a little ledge here. Once I've created that ledge, now we can continue on. They're gonna, I broke it in that demonstration. There. Now we've redeveloped that cut and we can continue on down the line. Now, one of the most important things, and I would say by far the most important part of any hand tool woodworking, particularly with saw, is that you want to make sure you're not cutting with your back saw at the And then you want to put a little more time back. And if you do that, it's just going to end up being perfect every time. It's just one of those okay. fantastic things. What you just said at the end, I don't know that anybody caught because I couldn't hear it. I'm in the same room as you. That was the joke. Oh, shut up. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hit the light. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone watches I got any, your leg. <laughs> if anyone watches any of the old Roy Underhill, um, you'll get that joke. <laughs> what else can I throw in? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, I want to show a few practices. But like with a hacksaw, um, when when cutting steel, you that. generally cut like this, and it's not a problem because it takes a lot of force to make a saw go off course in steel. Um, but when cutting dovetails. I just hold it like a dovetail saw. So let me show a little bit of that and the difference between that. And if you don't have a dovetail saw, a hacksaw actually makes a really good dovetail saw. It's a thin plate. Uh, it has very fine teeth. It cuts nice clean corners. And it works very well with that. Any question while I set, finish setting this up? Yes. The real Evora, Evora asks, can these saws be used for hardwood such as walnut? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, Actually, uh, I'll be showing a little bit of walnut here in a moment for the tests. Um, but yeah, I can use anything. I've even, even done it with um, uh, South American hardwoods, you know, uh, uh, Purple Heart. And uh, if there's a wood, you can cut it. <laughs> um, so let me show you this with, uh, let me switch over to this camera though. Uh, with the dovetails here, it won't change. There we go. So I've got my dovetail saw here. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. Let it work above. Let it slide on my finger and then take it down into the cut. Oop, got over aggressive. And you can make your cut. With the hacksaw, I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I'm gonna set it in here and let it work above. And look at that, really nice clean dovetail cuts. Now if I look at this really, really, really closely, my dovetail saw, uh, let's see if I can even get it that close. So I don't know if you're going to be able to see the difference, but in person, this one was my dovetail saw, and this one was the hacksaw. The hacksaw is a little bit bigger of a cut because there's a little bit more set on these teeth than there are in my dovetail saw. Uh, but in functionality or in cleanness, these are really, really similar. So there isn't going to be too much difference between those. But yeah, if you don't have the money, 
uh, for a dovetail saw. A hacksaw makes a really nice dovetail saw, and you can actually do a lot of joinery with one of those. So save the money. Um, for some reason, when people go out to buy a handsaw, the first one they think of is a dovetail saw because the dovetail saw is where all the skill's at. No, the first handsaw you should ever buy is a carcass saw, uh, which sounds horrible, but it is the most commonly used saw. And if you want to, you can do dovetails with this. If you want, you can do your mortises and tenons with this. It is the most versatile saw. Uh, it's just not the one that's really sexy and people think about, so yeah. Says the man in the short shorts. These are not <laughs> short shorts. They almost come to my kneecap. Um, mm. <laughs> what other question you have while I set the test? All right, test? so uh, ZZ asked, you, do you use anything to keep your tools from rusting after use? Uh, I have a full video on how to um, stop rust in your shop. Um, I just use uh, paste wax. I make my own paste wax, which I have a video on that as well. Uh, for my saws here, I'm often, if I'm doing a lot of cuts, I have this block of beeswax that I've infused with oil. It's like, uh, if I remember correctly, this one's 50-50 mix. And so it has a decent amount of oil in it. I'll just use that and I'll run it down the plate on both sides. This does two things. Number one, it makes it cut really nicely and very smoothly. It lubricates the cut. But number two, that wax and oil on the outside stop these from rusting. So for saws, um, just that little bit of beeswax will do the trick. So that's, that's what I use. So I just got a question about what brand is the saw? The hacksaw. Ah, uh, this one I believe is Aldi. Yeah, Work Zone. It's an Aldi saw. <laughs> I, yeah, I, spender. It is the, the, this is the cheapest one I could find. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, it's just about as. Why does this little thing flip up? Oh, it's a saw blade storage. Oh, that's interesting. So I could store extra saw blades. Is there any in there? No, in there. <laughs> that's kind of cool. I didn't realize that. A little saw blade storage. There. Yeah, I bought it from Aldi. Um, I think these ones come out on Father's Day um, around that. So they should be out here soon. Um, here, let me show you a, a, a great practice test. And I know this isn't going to be cutting those big, long rip cuts. But if you can do it with this small piece, you can take those same skills and develop them into rip cuts. And so what I have here is just a chunk of ingrained walnut standing up. So just like I'd cut dovetails. I can come in here and what I want to do is see how close together I can get all of these cuts. And the closer together you can get these cuts, the more control. Oh, see I slipped off there. I tried to get that really, really thin. This piece is actually thinner than the kerf of the saw. But let's try another one a little farther back. So I'll run one down and establish it, and then I'll put another one right beside it. And we'll see how close we can get, or how many we can get in a line across. There. And eventually you can get it to the point where you can get all of these little ones here that are about the same thickness as your saw plate running all the way down. So that's a great test. Just do a whole bunch of those right across the board. And think about the whole time, think about your body alignment. Think about the saw being in line with your arm. Think about everything being in the way. And so if you're getting down, getting in closer, you're going to find your arm moving out of the way. And you're going to want to think about, oh, yeah, i got to keep my body out of the way. I want to keep my arm in line. So that's one of the best skill ways, the skills to, to learn. And once you can do that on there, your body will eventually, over time, learn what that feels like. And you don't even have to think about it anymore because it's that same format that'll work here that will then work on the saw bench because your body is all in the same orientation, whether it be upright or horizontal. So, yeah. What question we got? Um, so, I think we've kind of gone over this. Brian Murphy asked, could you explain the differences between the Western saws, shape and length, so on? Um, oh, yeah. Um, so, I touched on it a little bit. The, the, the big ones are hand saws. They're usually longer than 24 inches. Um, this one's 26 inches, 26, I think 26 inches. Um, then you have your panel saws. They're a little bit shorter, they're smaller, um, but they usually have smaller teeth. These are a little bit more detailed, but you're still doing large work. And then you get in down to your back saws. 
The big ones are usually your tenon saws. They're tall. They're for cutting the cheeks of the tenon. So you're still cutting with the grain. So these have a rip tooth. Um, they're tall, long plate. They're a little indelicate, but they're great for cutting those long, big cuts, um, such as the, the cheeks of your, your tenons. Then you have your carcass saw. This does the work of your carcass, so the carcass of the, uh, the, the furniture that you're working on. This is what most of the joinery is done with. This has a cross-cut tooth. Now, this is a very, very confusing thing. This is a veritas saw, and veritas makes a carcass saw with a cross-cut tooth and a rip tooth. There is no such thing as a rip tooth carcass saw, and that really confuses people. <laughs> so don't buy the carcass saw with a rip tooth because it's, it's, it's not right. Um, it's not right in the head. Um, a carcass saw has cross-cut teeth. Um, so this is a cross-cut tooth. It's a little smaller than the tenon saw, as you can see. And then you move down again to the dovetail saw. And this goes back to rip-cut teeth. So you have rip-cut, cross-cut, rip-cut. And the dovetail saw is what gives you a lot more detail in um, all the way down. Now you also have your sash saw and a few others that come in there, but these are the most common ones throughout it. And you're often gonna see that they kind of come in pairs. So usually you have your carcass saw and your, uh, so usually you have your, your carcass saw and your dovetail saw, and those are the cross cut and rip cut saw. They're both a fairly similar size. And then you would have your sash saw and your tenon saw. So my sash saw is this one here. And they're fairly close in size, uh, but one of them's rip and one of them's mm -hmm. cross cut. And then you go down into your panel saws, and it's not uncommon to have similar sized teeth, but one of them we cross cut and one of them we rip cut. And the same thing with the hand saw. And you, they usually come in pairs. One of them is cross cut, one of them is hand cut, uh, one of them is rip cut. And so that works down through it. Did someone just super chat? Yes. Who was it? Greg Chang. Greg Chang. Education donation. Oh, well, thank you, man. So that means you get a dad joke. Uh, Oh, 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 here's a good one. I might actually do a whole series of this one for that. Why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at hiding. Have you ever seen one up there? It just shows you how good they are. <laughs> why, 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 do, uh, why do ducks have webbed feet? You're supposed to say why. Why? For stomping up forest fires. It? Why do elephants have flat feet? Why? For stomping out flaming ducks. ducks. <laughs> How do they get flat feet? How? They jump out of, of oak trees. <laughs> How do they get up in the oak trees? Is that what you're going to ask? Oh, I can't wait to find out. They sit on an acorn and wait. <laughs> Why was your brother running through the kitchen with paper towels on his head? Oh, I should know this one. Oh, there was a bounty on his head. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Mood Right, where we have lots of fun. So thank you, Craig. Any other questions? Oh, I, yes, I have lots. All right, well, we got time for a couple more. All right. Um, we might end up doing a and a next week. So Duck is patiently waiting for you to explain the handles and different ways to hold them. <laughs> you can hold it any way you want. And one of the things you'll notice is that the bigger saws, the handle tends to be more vertical and in line uh, at 90 degrees with the, the plate. Whereas the smaller dovetail saws, they tend to come out and rake farther and farther back until you actually get to your gent saws and coping saws where they've raked all the way back and now they're in line with the plate. Um, and that's just usually more detail and how close down to it you get. If you're working with something lower down, you want your hand to be rotating more to be 90 degrees of the plate. If you're working with something detail and you're getting close to it and you're hunching over it, you want to be able to rotate your hand farther forward. And so that's why with most of the detail and smaller saws, the hand will then rotate to get a more comfortable grip when you're looking at it closer. So, yeah. Good question. <gasps> do we have to do another dad joke? Uh, I think you would disappoint, unfortunately. Who it? it is Space City Junk Removal. Ooh, that's a fun name. I'm sure there's a story behind that somewhere. Um... Ah, <laughs> the other day, a friend came up to me and says, what rhymes with orange? And I says, no, it doesn't. Okay, I kind of <laughs> like that one. I don't want to. <laughs> oh, I 
love my life. <laughs> I love my wife. Well, you see, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's another question? <laughs> That's a question, or you want another question? <laughs> um. So Bob Brewer asked, when starting the curve, my miter saw skips across the wood on the push stroke. I don't experience this with my hand saws, even the large tooth aggressive rip saw. Is there a remedy for skipping? Um, that can be caused by a couple different things. Um, number one, the saw could be dull, in which case then the teeth aren't biting in and they're just kind of bouncing on the top. Um, that is actually a, a common thing. Um, number two, it could be that you're putting too much force into the saw and it's actually like bouncing out. Um, the easiest way to remedy that is lift the weight off of the saw, put the weight back on the, the back horn here. That's what this back horn here is for. It's to rest against your hand and all the weight can then rest on that horn. Um, and so if you're doing that, you can take the weight off the board and just let the teeth skip across the top um, and see if that fixes it. It could just be your body format with having the handle at a different angle um, as the smaller saws again have the handle um, raked forward. So most of the time it's body mechanic, but if it's working with your other saws, it may be that your teeth are dull. Um, but then again, there are so many other little things that can come into it that you just have to experiment and play with um, or have someone come and look at you and say, oh yeah, that's what you're doing. One of the best ways to fix your problem is to set up a camera, set one right in line with the saw so you're going across and you'll see your, your arm alignment and then have another one set up across so you can see your movement this way. You video yourself and everything will make sense. <laughs> it's really one of those powerful things of like, oh, oh yeah, I look like that, I'm a dork. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I learned rather quickly is because I have to video everything I do. <laughs> what else we got? Uh, let's see. My back came out. Space City Junk Removal asks, what's a decent brand rip saw for beginners that won't break the bank? Um, well, rip saws are very hard to find. Um, there's a company called, uh, pa I want to say Pax. Someone will put it down in the comments. I can't remember what it is. Um, but they make some uh, panel saws that are ripped tooth that you can buy new. Those are still like 120, 150 mm. bucks a piece. Um, but for a new saw, that's actually a really, really good price. Um, as to rip saws, usually the best place to go is to go to your antique store and find one. Um, they are the easiest hand tools to find, those or braces. Um, I've got probably about 20 or so of them down there waiting to be restored. And even if you find one with a cross cut tooth, you can very easily refile it by just changing the file when you sharpen it, uh, which is a great skill to learn. And if you're picking up these saws for five bucks a piece because they need a lot of work, it's a great way to learn. Don't even sharpen, uh, don't clean them up, don't, don't restore them, just practice your sharpening on that junk saw and you can learn very quickly. But that's the, the easiest way to learn, the easiest way to find a, a rip saw is to um, find an antique or to find a crosscut saw and then file it into a rip saw. Just make sure it doesn't have hardened teeth like the new plastic handle ones do, um, because you, you're you're going to ruin your your saw. You're going to ruin your files trying to sharpen the hardened teeth. One more. Uh, one more. Okay. Um, Frank Marabe asked, "Could you explain some of the differences between the different back saws, i.e., carcass and tenon? Did we already do that? Oh, yeah, I already did that one. Okay, next one." Uh, Douglas Style Jr. wanted to know what kind of oil you used for the wax mix in your uh, Be the Bees Wax. Um, I have an entire video on making boiled linseed oil if, and uh, making uh, paste wax. If you go into Google and you search how to make paste wax, it's the first one that comes up. Um, there are very few people who make their own paste wax on YouTube. Um, and it's, uh, I use boiled linseed oil actually for mine because uh, it's when it's suspended in the wax, it won't cure until it comes out. Um, I have also used raw linseed oil. Um, for my wax prevention oil, I actually use a three-in-one oil, um, so a lightweight machine oil. Um, but you can use just about any oil. I know a lot of people who use uh, olive oil, actually. When it's suspended in the, in the wax, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go rancid. So there's no oxygen connected to it. So, yeah. All right. I think I have three quick questions, and then we'll call it quits if that's okay. Okay. So Greg Cheng asks, should we practice with hardwoods or softwoods, and is there a difference in technique regarding the two? Generally, softwoods are harder because it's very easy for the saw to move around in the cut. Uh, so softwoods, 
it's very easy to over control on them. Hardwoods, it's very hard to over control because it makes slower progression. So it's easier to spot, oh, I'm going off course back up and to correct it. Whereas with softwoods, you can make several swipes before you realize, oh, I'm going off course and now you're a long ways down. Um, so one is not really easier than the other per se. Uh, it's just hardwoods, you go slower. So it's easier to spot that you are going off. So, yeah. All right, Moonwolf71 wants to know, how can you tell a rip from crosscut saw? Um, I have an entire video on what is the difference between rip, set and, rip cut and cross cut. Uh, definitely go take a look at that because um, it, it, I can explain it, but it's going to take more time than we have. And that video goes into a lot more detail so you can spot them very easily. So yeah, look up cross cut versus rip cut and you'll see that there. Last but not least, Aubrey Kuhn asks, are there any uses for the very small razor saws marketed at hobby work? <laughs> um, not really. Um, unless you're doing like uh, um, balsa models, they're, they're not really useful in, in standard joinery. Um, so yeah, you'd be better off with a hacksaw for most things. Owns this Klar. What's that? Owns this Klar. We're done. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions about um, how to do something, the easiest way, if you're looking for one of my videos, is to type in the search wood by right and then whatever topic you want, and you'll find my videos listed in there. Um, or you can go to my channel and there's a little search box in there so you can search in just my channel. Um, but if you're ever looking for something, the best place to start is in that search bar. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to send me a message and I'll try and get to as many of those as I can. So I think that's about it. Anything for you? Looking forward to seeing people next week at the Midwest Tool Collectors Association meet. So that is going to be a lot of fun. So I think that'll Someone has to stay home with the kids, so you just get him. <laughs> yes. Cool. Well, until next time, have a wonderful day. Aria, hang on now. I'm looking for the button. Where's the button?